Hello there, everyone. It is your bud. Today, I'm going to be talking about Contiki. I'm going to be t discussing the movie and the event. So we're going to be looking through a few things. Number one, the sketchbook by the Navigator. And number two, I have some actual clippings so you get to actually see. All right, let's start off with the back here so you get to know who we're talking about. Thor Heyerdahl, he's the one in charge. And there's Eric Hesselberg, the illustrator who was actually the only man who had been to sea before. No one else on the expedition had been to sea. So, in 1947, Thor Heyerdahl and the crew of Contiki went from Peru to Polynesia by a raft. They were trying to prove a theory about how people settled because it was noted that certain gods and deities were being shown to have relations to others and Thor wanted to prove that people could make it just drifting on the currents to Polynesia. So he built a raft only using what he knew could have been used and then he went to sea. Him and his friends went to sea and they just drifted. There was a movie of this and the movie is actually really enjoyable if you like anything to do with the ocean or the sea. Alright, here we go. This is a good place to start. 1500 years ago, there were many in Peru who knew Contiki. Contiki. The sun was the greatest of the gods in those days, and Contiki stood between the sun and the people. Tradition says that he was white skinned and had a beard. So it says that Contiki started in South America, and then he was attacked and managed to escape on the coast with some friends, and there embarked on a balsa wood raft and disappear across the Pacific to go home to the sun, the legend says. So these are many depictions of Contiki. So all of these are images of Contiki that were found in America. 1500 years passed without anyone giving another thought to it. But then Thor Heyerdahl began to think about Contiki and that was no wonder because he was studying the problem of Polynesians' origins, a problem which has turned many people's hair gray. So the Polynesians live on a number of small islands over here, as you can see, quite a distance from South America, roughly in the middle of the Pacific. It was unknown exactly where they came from. Many curious monoliths with bear, which bear witness to a high culture. So Easter Island is in Polynesia. So if you think of these uh, Polynesian, sorry, the Easter Island stone heads as sort of, I don't know, longer versions of the Olmec and Toltec, but passed on throughout different cultures and things like that. One of the gods in Polynesian legend is called Tiki. So now we're into Polynesia. Polynesian legend and one of the greatest gods was called Tiki. He was the greatest of gods on some of the islands. He was the son of the sun <laughs> and led his people out into the Pacific. Thor Heyerdahl lived on these islands for a time and heard a lot of talk about Tiki from someone named I think Te Tu- uh, from someone whose name I can't pronounce. And then at last, Thor Heyerdahl became so interested in the Polynesian's origin that he devoted himself wholly to the study of the question. He worked for many years, and he came to the theory that they originated in South America, and, and that Contiki from Peru and Tiki in Polynesia were the same person. Contiki went home not to the sun, but to Polynesia with his balsa raft. Thor Heyerdahl was so sure of it that he wrote a thesis and put it up to the American speculists. But no one would believe that a balsa raft could carry people 4,300 miles across the open sea. So he says, I'll prove it if it's possible. And then he went to actually build a raft and float it. <laughs> How amazing is that? So here we have Thor and the historian talking to him. See if there's some more pictures. There's a picture of the raft. And there's a picture of the raft. So as I said, there's a movie about this, so if you're interested in learning more, you can actually watch the movie. It's, it's really enjoyable. It's one of my favorite movies about the ocean. There's some really beautiful scenes. So discussing the structure of their raft. <laughs> It was pretty basic. Feel free to pause on any of these if you want to actually read more of the stories. And then apparently they took one last trip to the Andes to, <laughs> to drink in the impressions of rock and earth. And then they were off to sea. And then the raft was named Contiki. And then they were gifted sunflowers. <laughs> I like that. A Thor gave someone sunflowers afterwards. And then they unfurled the sail so everyone could see Contiki. And then I think they slowly, slowly left port. And a parrot landed on the ship as well, which is interesting. So a bunch of boats followed them out until it went dark. And then after it went dark, they were alone on the sea. <laughs> Then they started feeling some sympathy for the cockroaches that managed to sneak aboard their raft. So there was a parrot, there was a crab, they got to see some fish that looks like a parrotfish or something. And then a storm hit, so soon they didn't have time to think about anything else. 
and then they just left the creatures to the mercy of the current. Could you imagine going through a storm on a balsa wood raft? That would be crazy. Now they had a musician, they had a navigator, they had someone who knew how to build things. Thor Heyerdahl's going because he's not missing this trip for the world. So all they had was a wireless radio. More sea life. They got to see some flying fish. A lot of these scenes are, are in the movie, so... <laughs> then they freaked out when a snake-like fish jumped in right at the cabin door. <laughs> and into Torstein's sleeping bag. <laughs> and it was in the darkness. That's hilarious. <laughs> Could you imagine? That would freak me out. Sea turtles. So finally they get the first clue that they're going in the right direction. The southeast trade winds blew sure and steady. Sakontiki kept a good speed, so they went two sea miles an hour. I'm not exactly sure what the measurement is there, but so they would just take a wood chip from the raft and throw it in the water and then use that to see which way the faster current was. So they couldn't really do much to influence the course. They were mostly just drifting and using the current and their one sail. The cabin only had one opening and we made sure to have that on the lee side so that the sea should not come in. Because very often the raft twisted around and the sail kicked like a wild horse. You can imagine how crazy it would be to be on just a balsa wood raft with like three or four other dudes. <laughs> and then all the guys started to grow beards. <laughs> That's hilarious. And it says that uh, Ben had the biggest and most stylish beard, but on top of his head there was not a single hair. Yep, yeah, so just a bunch of guys on a boat just growing out their beards, not wearing a shirt, fishing and hunting, just drifting. And then they caught a big fish that it took two men to carry. That's how big the fish was. Ow. Swordfish 2. There were sharks. 28 sharks. Oh, never mind. So what they did, since they didn't have a proper shark hook, is they put these cod hooks tied together and stuffed into a dolphin's stomach, and then they just drop it in the water, and they were catching sharks by just pulling that in. They caught nine sharks. Wow. All right, I really like this drawing. That's very beautiful. That's a really beautiful drawing. Apparently sharks have bad eyesight. <laughs> it says here the shark has bad sight, so nature has the, had the idea of giving it three or four little pilot fish as constant attendants. <laughs> so the pilot fish act as the shark's eyes. That's interesting. I never really put that together. And apparently the pilot fish started following Contiki. <laughs> they had like 60 to 70 of them under the raft at one point. That's interesting. And then one day a whale shark appeared, said it's a sight they shall never forget. Wow. Could you imagine just being on a balsa wood raft and having a whale shark appear? We got some fairly good drawings. Hmm. Oh, so as soon as they saw it, they roared quite loud, shrieking and laughing at the same time. The creature was so unbearably huge and strange. The tension was unbearable. Would the monster start chewing at the balsa or not? We realized that it was a whale shark. They can grow 60 feet long and weigh 15 tons. Wow. It had a crowd of pilot fish ahead of it. <laughs> That's interesting. The sea's just full of life. <laughs> it says that uh, it came up to the boat and lay under the steering area, and then they thumped him a bit, but only in a friendly manner, to see how he took it. But apparently he liked it and came back and let himself be thumped three or four times. <laughs> so they just came along and patted a whale shark. Then they nearly got capsized by whales. Whoa. Large school of them bore straight down on the logs. They couldn't do that, they just had to s sit there and watch a bunch of whales go by. <laughs> Apparently they, it says he, they didn't know anything about keeping to the right either. <laughs> Whoa. It says they felt the backwash when they dived underwater. Saw a bunch of whales leap. And he says it's curious that 120 ton creatures live on microscopic animals. Interesting. Ooh, and then some start, more cool stuff starts to appear. Apparently there was one that looked like a guitar with legs. <laughs> and then they made a little uh, place where you could sit in and look at the... It's a little uh, diving basket. So they've been at sea for two months and we're more than halfway. That's pretty good. Polynesia here, Peru there, and they're halfway there in two months. And apparently they never got bored with each other on two months. <laughs> they became like six brothers, it says. And the Contiki gave no trouble, nor did we, nor did we. <laughs> so what they do, if one of them wanted to be alone, if they felt like they needed to be away from people, they'd put the rubber dinghy out, tie it by a, a string, and then they'd just sit like away from everyone. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> oh no! Lorita the parrot got carried away and then eaten by a shark. No, poor Lorita. So a breeze took away someone's sleeping bag. Someone tried to catch it but made a false step and tumbled into the sea. As the raft was making good speed, it passed before they could catch hold of it. And the steering was covered with seaweed so slippery that they couldn't get a grip of that either. The whole thing happened so quickly that none of them could help. 
And then someone acted quickly. Uh, they flung out a life belt with a line, jumped into the sea, and swam back to get Herman with a life belt. He was the only. He was only just in time, for Herman was already exhausted, and a shark's fin was approaching. After this, we realized that a fall overboard was the most dangerous thing. That Contigi could face storms and great beasts, but she could not pick up a man who lay in her wake. Oh, that's just. Oh, it gives me chills. Oh. They were now drawing near to the Polynesian Islands. The weather was no longer so dependable. They got tons of rain. And then one morning, after 93 days, we saw the easternmost of the coral islands, Puka Puka. A low island lay to port. There was no doubt of that. And our reckoning said it was Puka Puka. So there was no doubt either that we had reached Polynesia. But Kontiki had just tumbled on the westward wind and, and current and did not care if there were ever so many Puka Puka islands in the neighborhood. She would not let herself be maneuvered to any island. She did not want to go there herself. And Puka Puka disappeared astern of us. But three days later, we sighted another, which was called Angatau. We came so close to the island that we saw every coconut ashore and got ready for stranding. But when there was only another 50 yards, the current carried us past the westernmost point and out to sea. Just then, a canoe came from the shore. Good night, says one of them. This is fine, we thought. He speaks English and asked what the island was called. Good night, he said again. Then Torstein wanted to know how his mother was, and the answer to this too was good night. <laughs> That's funny. His way just says good night, good night, good night. So that they had to get past the coral, and then on August 7th, 101 days from Peru, the voyage was over. For that morning, the lookout shouted, land ahead. It must be Reroya. It must be one of the larger islands. A look at the chart convinced us that it was, but how far off it was wasn't easy to stay. So we stood by, and then they finally got to the corals, the waves crashing over it. They were fighting to stay alive. There was a smashing and twisting and crashing until what was left of the raft was halfway up the reef. Then we jumped down onto the red corals one by one and ran it across the reef to safety. And after us, in very truth, came the raft too. Like a good-natured horse with Thor and Torstein on his back, I can tell you that we were pleased with our raft. It had brought us to Polynesia with our lives and most of our equipment safe. That Kontiki, son of the sun, could have come to Polynesia in the same way was quite certain. It's a pretty amazing accomplishment, isn't it? They proved something that many, many people thought was absolutely crazy. They had made it to Polynesia. If you want to learn more about the story, you can feel free to watch the movie or look, up, look this up yourself. It's one of the greatest human feats of exploration that I think has ever been done. Absolutely inspiring. I can't believe they've made that entire journey. Wow. I hope you found this interesting. If you want to know more, Leave any questions or suggestions below, and I'll see you in the next video.